Coming up, difficult poses, potential psychosis, and a ritual that's bogus. Also, the worst way to win the lottery, adventures in quick bread, and your deep burning questions answered in the most drunken way possible. All this and more on this heavily charismatic episode of Kiss the Goat. X, and this is Kiss, Kiss the, the goat. goat. Light a candle for the sinners, set the world on fire. The incredibly heavy and annoyingly squeaky wooden doors of the online shrine to satanic cinema have once again swung open wide. You know, come to think of it, those doors probably aren't up to code. Yeah, we'll deal with that later. The moon has risen, the recycling has been sorted, and the ritual is about to begin. Find your place within the sacred circle. All are welcome here in the dark. This is episode 57 of Kiss the Goat, and welcome to it. If you're a regular listener to the show, and why wouldn't you be, you've probably noticed that we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of episodes talking about food. Well, yeah, there was that cake that Stephanie made for you. I'm trying to forget about that. Yeah, and there was also that gigantic, girthy vegetable sub I got on the last episode. How was that, by the way? It was filling and satisfying. Excellent. Yeah, I'm glad I got pictures of you with that thing. Heh, <laughs> dirty. We decided to take one more trip into the dark side of the culinary world on this episode as we venture into what Frank Zappa, our blessed St. Frank, would refer to as the dangerous kitchen here at the Shrine. Cootie and I are going to prepare some food ourselves. Well, I mean, they can't watch us do it. I guess they could sort of listen. I mean, maybe we'll take video of it. We'll throw it up on our new Instagram page. Why do you want to throw up on Instagram? Well, that's not... No, no, I I don't want to do that. Well, I mean, if you insist, I'll grab my phone. No, no, that's not happening, especially not right now. We've got a theme for this episode, and it does not involve puking. However, this episode does involve cooking. Oh, so this is Cook the Goat. No, I mean, well, maybe. Well, I mean, I don't like goat meat. It's really stringy and greasy. Well, we're not going to actually cook a goat, but this episode could be called Cook the Goat. That doesn't make any sense. All right, look, a lot of this is going to be explained later on in the show, which we do hope you acolytes will stick around for, because during movie time, we'll be taking a look at the 2010 pseudo-documentary The Last Exorcism. Yeah, that's a bit of a divisive pick, isn't it? Lots of people were displeased with that movie's ending. Yeah, we'll burn that bridge when we get there. Right now, it's time for the Devil in the Details, our roundup of snippets of Satan stuff. Dateline London. Dateline? Dateline? The fuck is this, the 1940s? Should I put in, like, a sound effect of an old typewriter? <laughs> Say it like some old-time reporter. Dateline London. See? See? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Nah. Nah. Here's your new story. Yeah. Hot off the presses, kissy lips. Yeah. Okay, we gotta stop. Because... <laughs> because this story's awful. And I'm not trying to make fun. Yes, since when? Hey... To quote George Clooney, I'm an asshole, but I'm not a fucking asshole. Jesus. Should we just start over? I mean, <laughs> should we? Let's just start over. Okay, hold yep. on. Hold yep, on. Probably. Right on. Okay, three, two. Oh, 
A teenager in London was found guilty earlier this July after murdering two women in an attempt to fulfill a pact he had made with a demon. It gets worse. The pact involved the teenager hitting it big in the lottery. Danielle Hussein, who is now 19 years old, stabbed both Nicole Smallman and Bibba Henry in a London park after Henry's birthday party. She was 46 years old, and Smallman was 27 years old. Oh, and did we mention this? Smallman and Henry were sisters. All this is horrible enough. In my head, anyway, it's all made worse because Hussein killed the women in the belief that if he fulfilled his oath with a demon called Mighty King Lucifuge Rofocal, he would win the Mega Millions Super Jackpot. During the investigation, officers discovered that Hussein had purchased three lottery tickets after committing the murders. He didn't win. A photograph published by Reuters in July showed the agreement Hussein had written with the mighty king Lucifuge Rofakal, in which Hussein promised to perform a minimum of six sacrifices every six months for as long as I am free and physically capable. He also promised to sacrifice only women, build a temple for you, and do everything that I have promised. Why only women? That's so fucking weird to me. To sacrifice only women. There's yeah. There are other issues here. In exchange, Hussein wrote that he expected the demon to arrange it so that he won the Mega Millions Super Jackpot, as well as other, quote, fruitful rewards, end quote, consisting of wealth and power. Hussein also requested to, quote, never be suspected of any crimes by the police and also that the police will never know of any crimes that I have done and that I will do. Yeah, well, obviously that part didn't work. Hussein signed the agreement in his own blood. He left a space for the mighty king, Lucifuge Rofokal, to sign their name, too. And perhaps tellingly, in the photograph, that area was shown to be blank. Kind of a one-sided agreement there, which is probably the case with most deals with the devil or other denizens of the underworld. Mighty King Lucifuck Rofocal is, according to the Grand <laughs> Grimoire, Hell's treasurer he is also in charge of the government of Hell. It seems like Lucifuck is far less a king and more of a mayor or an alderman. Pretty sure Danzig named his second solo album after Lucifuge, too. Hussein won't be sentenced until September, but he's looking at a mandatory life sentence for the crimes. Okay, look, I don't care what side of the spiritual fence you're on. Those murders were stupid and senseless. You know, we're not denying or making little of the fact that Hussein is probably mentally ill. What is curious is the entire concept of making a deal with the devil or a demon in this case. I mean, if you're a Christian, you wouldn't make a deal with the devil anyway because he's a king of lies. And as you no doubt learned in Sunday school, Satan can't be trusted. If you're not a Christian, why the hell would you make a deal with any entity whose claim to fame is that they're in charge of... Hell's Utility Company or something. <laughs> Besides, making any kind of pact like that would insinuate that you believe in hell. And as we've talked about here on KTG, if you believe in hell, you have to believe in heaven. And if you believe in heaven, you got to believe in hell. You're a majority of the way to being a Christian. Well, I mean, what if you're a Satanist? Well, modern Satanists don't believe in a literal Satan. It's like saying that you believe in... Krampus, or the Easter Bunny, or, I don't know, Pet Boy from the Fallout games. I've never heard of anybody creating a pact with an Easter Bunny. What would that even be? <sighs> Easter Bunny, king of the forest, <laughs> please bring me all the gaily wrapped peanut butter cups and chewy caramels. In return, I promise not to eat eggs, because rabbits lay eggs, and that's how that works, because I are the smart. <laughs> well, 
Okay, so if you're not supposed to eat the eggs, why does the Easter Bunny hop about handing them to everybody? I don't know. Maybe the Easter Bunny's pro-life. Okay, so he's handing the eggs out so we will, I don't know, adopt them? I don't know. Uh, Maybe? You know, if I were trying to make an omelet and I cracked an egg and a rabbit plopped out, I would be really really upset well yeah because that's not how biology works no because i would still be hungry you can't make a fucking omelet out of a baby rabbit (sighs) okay point being don't make pacts with demons it's a poor idea it doesn't work and if you make some kind of weird promise to a demon or the devil it's usually going to be about something that you wanted to do anyway Well, I mean, unless it involves meeting the devil at a crossroads at midnight so you can be a fantastic blues guitarist. That's that's probably okay. I don't know. I mean, take lessons, maybe? (laughs) Boring. (laughs) Well, do you know what's not boring? Movies. If you're lucky, some movies stink on us. Well, I can't say that about this episode's movie. Oh, spoilers! (laughs) Maybe, but what I can say is this. Shh, it's movie time. This episode's flick is The Last Exorcism from 2010, which distinguishes itself from other entries in the demon possession subgenre by putting forth the idea that the concept of casting out demons is a bunch of horse shit. I think this is one of the only possession movies I've seen that doesn't involve a vomiting scene. Is it a found footage movie? Is it a pseudo-documentary? You know, finding a difference between the two styles of film is a matter of semantics. But The Last Exorcism follows a charismatic evangelist named Cotton Marcus who travels to the ass crack of Louisiana to perform an exorcism. However, Marcus is bound and determined to expose the practice of forcing demons out of their human hosts as a racket. All fake. And traveling along with Marcus is a film crew there to document the entire event. The Last Exorcism first gained buzz after trailer footage of Ashley Bell, the actor that portrays the possessed girl, showed Bell contorting her body into seemingly impossible positions, practically bending herself backwards in one shot. It is creepy, especially when one realizes that there is no CGI involved. Bell, who spent years as a ballet dancer, could actually do that shit. And it was awesome. And this movie also marks the first major supporting role for Caleb Landry Jones, who um, plays a character also named Caleb. That's convenient. All right. And since then, Jones has been nominated for several awards for his work in the Jordan Pill horror flick Get Out and the ensemble drama The Three Billboards Outside Ebbing's Missouri. Jones also released his first album called The Mother Stone in 2020. The actor that no one seems to talk about from this movie is Patrick Fabian, the guy who plays Cotton Marcus. Fabian's done a lot of television work, including a stint on the Breaking Bad companion series Better Call Saul. I mean, if you've watched TV in the last 30-some-odd years, you've seen Patrick Fabian. But, and I'll talk about this more later as I get more and more drunk, but Fabian's performance in The Last Exorcism is some of the best work in a horror movie I've ever seen. A lot of the story is placed directly on Fabian's shoulders, and he turns in some fucking great work. (laughs) Yeah, but did you like him? Later, later. More beer for X. Right now, let's crack some bones we didn't know we had and wiggle our way into the last exorcism. Meet Cotton Marcus. He's a preacher, he's an evangelist, and he is slicker than goose shit. Like his father before him, Marcus has preached the gospel for years. Also like his daddy, Cotton Marcus has performed quite a few exorcisms over the years. Cotton has a pretty wife. He's got a sweet preteen boy. And Marcus is shown preaching at his father's church. Now, Marcus was a child evangelist, much like one of KTG's favorite performers, Marjo Gortner. 
<laughs> Marcus, much like Gortner, has turned a bit cynical. He says a part of the gig as a preacher is to get into the people's wallets because, quote, the church doesn't run on love, end quote. Cotton's wife describes Cotton as a creative. He's made small movies. He's a showman. He does magic tricks. Marcus is shown during a sermon using a giant deck of cards to get his point across with, you know, the Jack of Spades representing the Prince of Lies and all that Jesus. good shit. I have met so many people like Cotton, you know, like they're just there to entertain, keep the people interested Get those butts in the pews. <laughs> butts in seats. It's the old, it's, it's fucking Mick Foley. Get the butts in seats. Yeah, and that's but the thing all that it I is. Like, the thing that I like about Cotton's character, though, is that it, even if he, he's got, he's cocky. I mean, don't get me wrong. But even if he didn't start out that way, he has developed a conscious. And I think that, I mean, and he talks about, what happened with his son so maybe he just developed one i don't know well i think he got scared straight and that's the thing mm -hmm. outside of the church marcus tells one of the documentary filmmakers and there's two of them there's iris who runs sound maybe the producer of the film and then there's what was that was it daniel was it daniel the cameraman um hang on i've got his name written down somewhere do you yeah, I don't think it was Daniel, though. Two the, seconds. The director of the last exorcism was named Daniel. Daniel Dave. Sam. Dave. Dave. Dave Dan it, it was a D word. You were really close, yeah. <laughs> Marcus tells one of the documentary filmmakers that once the service really gets into the groove, the people aren't even listening. And he bets her ten bucks that he can go in and preach a banana bread sermon to the people and the producer thinks that's ludicrous of course but by the gods marcus does it and it's one of the best scenes in the whole fucking movie it He's, is and it really drives home his point it does he throws that banana bread recipe out in the middle of his sermon and the people yell hallelujah and marcus just stares straight into the camera and he points and he can't stop laughing and he's all praise jesus praise jesus because they fucking bought it and they didn't hear a goddamn word he said it's oh, well, amazing and it's a really powerful point too though because i mean i know you've witnessed this i can't tell oh, you sure. how many times i've sat through a sermon and the preacher will say fucking anything in the pulpit as long as he has the the congregation worked up to that pitch they're going to hallelujah any goddamn thing he says. It's because he's got the cadence right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he's got them in that right place, that right, right state of mind. And the energy's flowing. And he could start mm -hmm. quoting lyrics from a Chuck Berry song, just absolute nonsense, talking about his ding -a -ling or whatever. <laughs> and, and they are going to applaud and praise God, and they have no idea what they've just been told. It's, yeah. a, it's a lack of critical thinking that goes away in favor of emotionalism. And this movie portrays that like crazy. It's so good. Now, mm -hmm. now in Marcus's father's office, and his father is also a preacher, the elder Marcus retrieves a book from a combination safe. And this book is called The Hortus Delicarum. And a, <laughs> I want to open a deli named to that. <laughs> It's called the King Lucifuge Hortus Delicarum. <laughs> um, according to Marcus's father, only about 20 copies of this book exist worldwide, and it's essentially a grand grimoire. It describes demons, their names, and how they operate. So the book helps exorcists identify demons, and then it tells the reader how to cast them out. The elder Marcus says that there have been exorcists in their family for generations and that he himself has done about 150 exorcisms with the Hortus Delicarum. So here's my question. Do you think that the Hortus Delicarum, the demon compendium, was real? 
I don't mean in real, like in a real world sense, but strictly in the universe of the film. Do you think that any preacher in the Marcus family had ever done a real exorcism? Yes. Really? Yes. So you think that was like the Necronomicon and the Evil Dead universe? Yes. That kind of shit exists in the real world. Yeah, but how often does it find its way into the hands of a Pentecostal preacher? Well, fuck, I don't know. I've never been in a Pentecostal preacher's office. You think he, like, got it off eBay? No. I think it was picked up at a flea market in West Virginia by his great-granddaddy, and he handed it down. Every every son that became a preacher, it got handed down. That's... I can't even say <laughs> nothing. That's just so fucking accurate. Oh, my God. I can't even talk about that. All well, right. What's interesting to me is Cotton's view of exorcism. Okay, so he's going through all this, and he's showing – and he's talking about it. His view, it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. He's, he calls it a service, and then the next breath he calls it a scam. So – it's almost like he's trying to make himself feel better about all of the shit he's been doing over the years. I don't know. In an interview with the filmmakers, what you'd call a confessional segment on a reality show today, Cotton tells the story of Lucifer, how Lucifer fell from grace and he was cast out of heaven and he took one third of the heavenly host with him. Now, Cotton refers to that event as the setup of the entire Bible. And he says, if you believe in God, you have to believe in the devil, which mm -hmm. I fucking agree with. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself was an exorcist. So if you're a Christian and you believe in Jesus Christ, you have to believe in demons. Part of me really believes that he is describing most Christians as gullible and easily set up for the sting of exorcism with that line. Yep. Marcus goes to the post office to check his mail. Now, inside of his P.O. box are requests for him to perform exorcisms, and he shows one to the camera that says, please open immediately, only envelope, and Cotton explains that exorcism is bigger today than it's ever been. The Vatican has hundreds of exorcists in its employ that we know of, and as Cotton says, the Catholics, they're not telling us everything. So Cotton makes the point that the Roman Catholic Church gets most of the credits for exorcisms because they get the press because they got the movie, and that makes mm -hmm. them culturally significant. But every denomination conducts exorcisms, which is true. Cotton says he did his first exorcism when he was 10 years old. Now, Cotton's son, Justin, who's just a cute... Just He's adorable. I love Cotton's kid. He's got a hearing loss issue. Now, he says that his dad fights demons and other monsters, but that Cotton doesn't really believe in those things. And when he's asked point blank by the filmmakers if his dad believes in, in demons, Justin just kind of puts his finger up over his mouth and it's like, shh. Then he shakes his head, no. So everybody in the family knows that Cotton Marcus doesn't believe in this shit for damn it. Yeah, and it's interesting to me, too, that his wife is on the same page as he is. Like, I kind of – because, I mean, you got to imagine him being raised in church and, in his own words, being groomed to preach from such a very early age that that's probably where they met. Exactly. You don't marry outside the faith. Right. So, you know, so they she, had to have been at church. And she also apparently went through the same type. I, I think it just speaks volumes for their communication, I guess, and their compatibility. But I think it has to do maybe less with that and more with the fact that their kid almost died mm -hmm. because he was a premature baby. And that's why he's got the hearing loss issue. So Shared probably, trauma. Yeah, probably that more than, than anything. And even on camera, Cotton admits that he doesn't believe in actual demons and that his exorcisms have all been an act. But he won't call himself a fraud. Mm -hmm. This is what you were talking about earlier. He explains that he's been delivering a service for a person who needs it, 
in the way that they need it. Mm -hmm. Now, he says that exorcisms have helped people heal from their own belief that they were possessed. You know, and if it worked, it worked. That can't be a bad thing. So that's my question. Does exorcism, can exorcism serve a purpose? Could it actually help people? I'm pretty sure we've talked about this point before. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. Like, it 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 sounds like it's hypocritical to say, yes, I do think that exorcisms can help people, you know, provided you're not putting a fucking plastic bag over their face to suffocate the demon and therefore killing the host while you're doing it. And that just goes into the psychology of exorcism. So I think that they can help people because of how very real and how very powerful that fear is for those people and how wholesale they've bought into that. And yet at the same time, I know in my heart of hearts, it's a fucking scam. Just like Cotton said, I'm performing a service. It's a scam. If you tell me that I've got a big dick and you say it over and over and over again, eventually I'm going to believe that I've got a big dick. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. It's that kind of reinforcement, that mental and emotional reinforcement that what you think is wrong with you is not necessarily wrong with you. And I think that's kind of how exorcism works. It's a traumatic event. It's a shocking event. And I think in that respect, it might jar someone into um, becoming better, for lack of another term. It's like it'll, it'll help them stop thinking that they're a terrible person because they've been, once again, just fucking blessed by the blood of the lamb and everything's cool. Yeah, it's I think it's their belief. It's it's like, you know, we talk about all the time with taking our fucking supplements and herbal teas. Like, does this w really work? I don't know, but I feel better. Well, it might be, you know, fucking all in my head, but who cares? Right. But the end can, result's the same. Right. But you can't call the movie The Last Placebo. Right. <laughs> Give it a name. Right. Cotton's wife explains, yeah, the son was born early and he almost didn't make it. But when it turned out that their son was going to be OK, Cotton didn't thank God. His first thought was to thank the doctors. So that caused a crisis of faith within Cotton. But he kept preaching because even though he was unsure if he believed in God because he was on autopilot, he kept receiving praise and money for his work. Right. Mm -hmm. And he would have kept on doing it if it weren't for a news story about a 10 year old boy in Texas who was killed during an exorcism ritual. Now, I pause this scene. I zoomed in on the fucking newspaper article that the movie shows. The exorcist placed a bag over the boy's head in order to, quote, capture the soul of the demon so he would not run into the soul of someone else. End quote. Yee. Brutal. That boy was autistic. This is a lot like the shit we talk about in the Devil in the Details mm -hmm. segment. So and that's probably a lot of the reason this movie works so well for me, because it feels so grounded in reality. Anyway, that story gave Cotton nightmares, and he would dream that he was an exorcist wrapping a plastic bag around his own son's head. Then he saw an article about the Vatican and the Vatican opened up an exorcism academy, an exorcism class. And we've talked about that right <laughs> here on KTG. We that. <laughs> yeah, we did. So that shit's real. And that shit caught in Marcus, and he became convinced that the influx of new exorcists would hurt people. So those two events, the, the, the dead kid in Texas and the Vatican opening up the exorcism academy wide to everybody else, 
uh, made him decide to blow the lid off of the exorcism racket. And he says if he could save one kid from being killed during one of those exorcism rituals, then he would truly be doing God's work. So the gambit here is that Cotton Marcus will choose one of the exorcism requests that have been sent to him. And the film crew is going to follow him to the location, and they're going to document the exorcism. While that's going on, Cotton plans to show the film crew all the tricks of the trade, how he makes the ritual seem convincing. So, out of all the letters on his desk, he chooses the envelope that we saw while he was at the post office. Please open. And the letter is from Ivanwood, Louisiana, and the writer says that his livestock is being slaughtered nightly. And that cinches it. Cotton and the film crew are off to Ivanwood, and Ivanwood's in a deep-ass part of Louisiana. He talks mm -hmm. about the history of the region and the mix of superstition and folklore and all the different belief systems, and he says that the background of the area make it the perfect region for stories about demons and hell. So before they get to the house where the possessed person is, we see Cotton uh, changing clothes in a gas station restroom, and he's putting on his linen suit, and he's like, he smiles at himself in the mirror, maybe I'll, maybe I'll sell real estate. Just a <laughs> slick motherfucker. And then we get stories from the locals at the gas station talking about uh, the gates to hell, which are over here by the airport, and the demon cults, which are up here like two streets over. And yeah, but this... where did the where did the aliens land? <laughs> oh well, that's right over there. <laughs> <laughs> this one woman talks about this cult that apparently the leader of the cult thought he needed to feed souls to Satan, which is creepy in and of itself. Meanwhile, Cotton drives up to the place where the possessed person is, and it's a farm. And coming up the other way is a pickup truck, so Cotton rolls down his window and asks for directions. And the guy says, well, that's cool. Um, what you want to do is you want to turn your ass around, go back to the highway, and get the fuck out of here, and I don't ever want to see you again. <laughs> Caleb. Caleb. It's Caleb. Caleb. Caleb is the scariest kind of redneck boy he really is like you know he is just capable of incredible violence and it is right beneath the surface and he is not scared to do it nope not at all i mean he throws rocks and mud clots at cotton's vehicle as it goes up towards the farm yeah and we talked about this while we were watching it. This kid is the same motherfucker that we saw at the Rob Zombie Alice Cooper show a few years ago. Just they're all hopped up on pot and meth. And you would think that would balance them out, but it doesn't. And they just nope. want to kill everyone that accidentally knocks into them or, you know, spills a Coke on their steel-toed boot, whatever. There's like, <laughs> That's like their first words to you is like some kind of horrible Flintstone grunting. They won't even talk English. They'd rather, they just as soon kill you as look at you. Yeah. So when they get to the farm, we've already met Caleb. And he is the son of the family where the possessed person is. And then there's Lewis. Lewis is the father. And then there's Nell. And Nell is the sweetser girl. And she's the one that's accused of being possessed. Which makes Cotton immediately regret his decision to haul ass off down to Ivanwood. He's like, I thought it was Lewis, not Nell. I hate working with kids. I hate working with kids. And Nail is played by Ashley Bell. So fucking good in this movie. Now, has she done anything else that I would know? Not that you've seen, no. She's been in a couple other movies. I need to watch Carnage Park. Is it Carnage Park? I think that's what she's in. I'm probably wrong. I'll edit it out later if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's done some other shit. Okay. I'm sure this is like her claim to fame, though, because as Nell, she's very meek and she's an artist. She's only 16 years old. She plays the recorder for fuck's sake. Yeah. Who <laughs> plays the goddamn? Nobody plays the recorder. 
apparently homeschooled girls in deep south Louisiana do. Lord. Well, she thinks she killed the livestock, but she doesn't remember. Now, her dad is a single dad because his wife died of cancer, and for some weird reason, she's buried right there on the fucking farm. That's not uncommon in the south. Well, that's true. There's a home graveyard right down the road from us, isn't there? Yeah. The reason that Nell is homeschooled is because Lewis pulled them out of church school because of the music. He thought the music was too secular in nature. But Caleb says that Lewis is a superstitious drunk, and he warns Cotton not to hurt Nell. Now, inside the house, Cotton does this kind of half-assed physical exam of Nell, like he touches her skull, her head, like he's checking for bumps or whatever. (laughs) And he finds an indentation in her neck, and he's like, "Uh uh-oh, this probably isn't good. Has this always been this deep? What? (laughs) Do demons do that? Do demons just, like, suck in your neck skin? (laughs) How does that work? Uh, The producer, um, Nell Nell really likes the producer's Doc Martens, so the producer gives Nell her Doc Martens, and she's just overjoyed. She's like, oh, these are so cute. It's such a wonderful thing. You didn't have to do this for me. She keeps calling her Miss Iris. Right. Nell puts her feet into a tub of water. Cotton asks for prayer. Everybody closes their eyes except Caleb. The water around Nell's feet appears to boil. Now, it's a bath bomb or a seltzer tablet or some shit. Didn't they do something like that in the Constantine movie? (laughs) Yes, except, you know, there were no seltzer tablets involved there. Well, Cotton says that the fact that her feet are so hot it made the water boil is a sign of possession. So he drags out the the the, the hortus delicarum, flips through a few pages, and says, here it is. Here's your demon. And his name is Abelab. Hey, this is where he makes some serious fucking mistakes. Right. Cotton says that Abelam defiles the flesh of the innocent and that salvation for the possessed can only come through death unless Nell is exercised. Like a bomb drop, dude. That's such a gut punch. And you, at that moment, you're just like, oh, shit, Cotton. What are you doing, son? Cocky son of a bitch. Right, because he thinks he could just skate away from this with no problems whatsoever. Yeah. Caleb saw Cotton reach into his pocket and throw the whatever, the fizzy thing, the baking soda and vinegar or whatever, throw it into the water around Nell's feet. So he's fine. He's, he tells Cotton, we don't have any problems now because he, know Cotton, he knows Cotton is faking his way through this entire thing. And then we see how Cotton rigs Nell's room. He puts up monofilament wires to move the pictures on the walls he's got a speaker like a bluetooth speaker for fake demon sounds he's got an mp3 player which he says has thousands of demon sounds on it (laughs) i hope he's got the well to hell on there because that would be great (laughs) he's got a crucifix where if you pour black powder into a tiny little tube it just makes smoke yeah poof so i want to take just a second to talk about the sweets are home Okay. Because this is like a quintessential backwoods southern home, okay? Christian iconography everywhere. There's a painting of fucking Scarlett O'Hara on Nell's bedroom wall. I did not notice that. Are you fucking serious? Large painting of Scarlett O'Hara in that fucking dress on her bedroom wall. I know what that house smells like, okay? It's like dust and sweat and lard and white lily and vinegar and floor wax and that soft, fine dirt that you can only find up underneath the porch. I have been in so many houses like that as a kid. So the ritual begins. Nell's lying down on the bed in her bedroom. Cotton's trying to exercise her, and he's making the pictures move, and he's making the demon sounds go, and he puts on these two rings on his thumbs and they're like electric shock rings like joy buzzers and he it's 
so great. I want those rings. <laughs> and he touches Nell's neck with it, and she kind of like, bleh, she spasms out. And then Cotton pulls a fucking James Brown. He's just like, I can't do it. <laughs> he does. I'm too weak. I can't do it. Baby, 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 baby. Like somebody should come and put a cape over him and lead him out of the room so he can thrust the cape off and go running back inside and continue with the exorcism. Uh, but then he pulls a Father Karras on us. He does. He's like, come into me. Take me, God, take me. And he falls to the floor and he's twitching and he touches the button on the back of the fake crucifix and says, and the smoke comes out. And then, the most important part as far as he's concerned, Cotton gets paid. Yep. Lewis just hands him a stack of fucking cash. And, Cotton, and he flips through it. I think he's flips counting it. it. I think, he, like a dick, I think he's just counting it. Like, what? Dude's going to leave out a fucking 20? Jesus, just take your shit and go. But he can't, because Cotton's like, what was that? I couldn't hear you. What did you say? And then he says that the Lord has a prophecy for Lewis. Cotton says Lewis's wife is in heaven, but that Lewis should stop drinking and accept the Lord's love. And that highlights a problem that I've had with charismatic religions from the word go. If the Lord has a message for me, why the fuck is he telling you uh-huh. to tell me? Fucking uh-huh. tell me. I'm right fucking here. I'm listening. What are you? Just, just fucking stop. Talk to yeah. me and not bozo the clown over here in the corner by the goddamn... In the linen suit. <laughs> right, in the linen suit by the, by the clown painting on fucking Nell's wall. Yeah, but this is when shit starts to get crazy. It does, because that night, Nell shows up at Cotton's motel. No idea how she knew where his motel was, but she just kind of pops in. She's sitting on the bed all catatonic, and when the producer, the one who gave her the Doc Martin boots, tries to... Miss Iris. Miss Iris. Yeah, Nell starts trying to kiss up and down Miss Iris's shoulders tries to take her gown off and then starts licking Iris when she's trying to stop her from doing it. <laughs> oh, shit. And then, oh, fuck. Well, then Nell pukes. Well, I was wrong earlier. Oh, there is a puking there scene. There is a puking yeah. scene. Fuck. It's very minimal, though. How is any puke minimal? <laughs> well, this is just a, like a little bit of, oh, like spit and then up? it's over with. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a baby spit up. Not like the projectile spit up, but just, you know, the baby's sitting there and all of a sudden it just kind of dribbles down the chin. It's not green. No, no. Okay. It almost looks like oatmeal. Ew. It's one of the less offensive puking scenes I can think of, to be Jesus. quite honest. I think, no, I think just talk. that's even worse. I think yeah. just talking about. Oh, about no. hell puking oatmeal. <laughs> I'm the one who has problems with puking scenes, and I'm grossing you out talking about Well, I'm about the this. one who has problems with Quakers. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. So Cotton and the film crew take Nell to the hospital, and they can't, you know, the doctors can't run a psych test on Nell without parental permission. So Lewis shows up at the hospital. And Cotton says, you know what? Your daughter needs professional help. Lewis does not like that. He says, psychiatry is not of God. And he quotes, I think it's Ephesians. My gut reaction was that it was the book of Ephesians. We were watching this for the billionth time the other night Mm -hmm. where he says, you know, the, the love of God pulls down strongholds and fights against principalities and powers and blah, 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 blah. No psych for Nell. And Cotton just takes the girl home. You know, and that's an accurate portrayal, too, though, and it's really, really unfortunate, and it's really damaging, that whole belief that psychiatry is not of God, because that strict fucking narrow scope of reality and that crucible of religion and indoctrination 
and shame is damaging. And there are so many people who don't get out of that and they are they are damaged psychologically because of that and they could benefit from help of a professional. No, I remember when I was younger. Now I'm in I'm old. I'm in my fucking fifties, okay? Now I remember when I was a kid, people used to praise doctors because they were like, Oh, well obviously the Lord meant for some people to be doctors and those people are helping you and when they help you that is like the hand of God. That is God using the doctors as an instrument to help you. When I was like eleven or twelve, that particular train of thought started going by the wayside and Christians mm. began to believe that there was a strict uh, chasm between religion and science and medicine, the science of medicine. And you could not bring the two together. I wonder what caused that shift. I want to thank Benny Hinn. Oh, man, that fucker. Obviously, before the 70s, faith healing was a big thing. And you saw evangelists doing that in tent revivals and um, right. on, on radio listening to radio shows and whatnot. But as we got into the 80s and things became more visually elaborate and extravagant, mm -hmm. I think we saw that line between the Lord will heal you and the Lord will use doctors to heal you become an even wider gap. Mm. And that's really discouraging. I mean, you can go on YouTube right now, look up Benny Hinn, and see him slaying an entire coliseum of people in the spirit. He waves his coat, and those people fall down like it's the anti-wave at a football game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like the fucking end of Return of the King. Sauron is defeated, and he explodes, and, like, everybody gets knocked over. And, the the, yeah, the, the shock shockwave. Wave. <laughs> right on. Cotton goes to visit Lewis's old church, the one that he pulled Nell out of the schooling program. And the guy's name is Pastor Manley. And he's Pastor a, Manley. And he's a second Calvary church. And we also meet Becky, who I don't know if that's Pastor Manley's wife or if she's just a secretary. But <laughs> the best contribution she makes to the movie is she just asks a question. And when anyone answers, she goes, oh, are y'all making a movie? Oh, am I? Are you recording it right now? Yeah, you're going to be on it. Ooh. <laughs> I don't even think she means to be funny, but goddamn, that shit's, that shit's funny. It is. So Pastor Manley tells Cotton that Lewis was hostile when he pulled Nell out of the church two years ago, but he says that he'll come out to the farm if Lewis agrees to his presence there. Now, when Cotton and the film crew go back to the farm, Caleb has been attacked. He's bleeding from his face. He's been He's cut. been filleted. He's been cut fucking deep. Now, Lewis says that Nell did it. Mm -hmm. Cotton says that he wants to take Caleb to the hospital, but Lewis says that he'll do it. But Caleb slips Cotton a note, and the note says, don't leave her alone with him which are probably six of the creepiest words I've ever seen in a movie. Blood-stained piece of paper with those words scrawled on it, yeah. Nell, of course, is crying because Lewis has chained her to her bed. And this is heartbreaking. She's sobbing that she's bad and she won't go to heaven. 16-year-old girl just sobbing her little fucking heart out. This is probably a good time to um, mention that I have an incredible disdain for the gaslighting of children by well-meaning Christian folk. Yep. I hate it. And I don't think I've seen any other scene in a film that translates that as well as this one. She's crying while the crew fucking saws through the chains, and she still is convinced that somehow this is her fault and she's not going to go to heaven, and it's just heart-wrenching. God, I hate it. Yeah. So Lewis takes Caleb off to the hospital. 
And that night, while Cotton and the film crew are staying in the Sweetser farmhouse, um, they hear some noises, and it's weird, and they go investigate, and they see Nell in the hallway, in the shadows, can't see her face, but she's catatonic, and she goes into the bathroom where there's a full tub, and she tries to drown one of her dolls. And there is a baby crying somewhere around there, distinct baby crying. Now, Nell is an artist, and when they take her back into her room, we see some pictures that Nell has created, and one of them is a picture of a dead cat with blood all over it. Now, Nell doesn't remember making the picture, but it's obviously fucking there, and the tape recording from the video that they've taken of Nell picks up Nell speaking Latin. <laughs> Latin, the official language of Christendom. Now tell me, how did Latin get to be the go-to language for possessed people? And especially in this movie, where we are not dealing with any Catholicism whatsoever. Yeah. Shouldn't the demon be speaking like King James English? You would think. I didn't see or hear any fucking Latin growing up in the church. No! No! I didn't Lots of either. people saying these and thous, but no fucking Latin. Right? We didn't dominus nobiscum. Nope. <laughs> we hithered and yawned, but we did not dominus nobiscum. That night, a doctor from the hospital calls and leaves a message on Lewis's phone. Turns out, Nell's pregnant. Dum, dum, dum. And the producer of the film pretty much blames Lewis. She freaks the fuck out. She is convinced that Nell's carrying an incest baby. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, while they're in the kitchen talking, Nell steals a camera while the crew is doing something. They're, they're sleeping or they're yakking or something. Nell goes out to the barn, and there's this really pretty white cat sleeping up on one of the shelves or rafter. What are the, whatever the fuck's in a barn? There's a thing. <laughs> And the cat's on the thing. So Nell takes the camera and she smashes the cat. Beats the fuck out the of the camera. kitty cat. And there's yeah. blood on the lens. The lens is all fucked up and she just smashes the living shit out of that. Oh, and it's terrible. Meanwhile, back in Nell's room, there are pictures that Nell has made of the film crew. And they're dead. They're fucking hacked to pieces. There's a picture of Cotton holding a cross up in front of a gigantic fucking wall of fire, and it's really disconcerting. And I don't care how much of a plot device it is, it's bothersome. Because Dave slips out because the, the depiction she made of him is he's decapitated. The reason that that works for me is because the way that the pictures are constructed it looks like folk art it yeah. looks like something that you would see in a flea market so it's definitely something deep southern okay mm -hmm. but it's almost yeah she doesn't really draw them as no. much as she like cuts images out of construction paper and glues them together like a diorama or something right it's very 3d mixed media and it's unsettling to look uh -huh. at Cotton hears people talking in Nell's room, and her room's locked. There shouldn't be anybody else there. So he's, like, knocking on the door, and she's like, oh, I wasn't talking to anybody, so I don't know what you heard. Sorry. Meanwhile, Lewis, it's late at night, Lewis comes back with Caleb from 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 uh, the hospital. Does Lewis ever ask for a refund? <laughs> I mean, No, he has not. I mean, Cotton's done the exorcism. It apparently has not worked. I'd be looking for my money back. You and me both. But this I is, think Lewis has other things on him, his mind. He does, because he hears the phone message that Nell's pregnant, and Lewis says, Abilab did it. It's the demon that got Nell pregnant, and the book, the Hortus Delicarum, backs that up. Yep. So Lewis asks Cotton to perform another exorcism, and Cotton doesn't want to. But Lewis says that if Cotton can't save Nell's soul, he's going to do it himself, because it's either the exorcism or the destruction 
of the flesh. So Lewis flat out says, I'll kill her. And that's when it becomes abundantly clear that Cotton fucked up in <laughs> telling him that that book written in Latin about the demon says that the only salvation is death. You never know how people are going to take things. Dude, you got to be real fucking careful. Lewis did not take this right. Lewis goes out and prays at his wife's grave before... He's like, I, what's he going to say? I mean, you can't hear him, but it's like, honey, look, I have to blow our daughter's head off because she's possessed by a demon. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are you okay with that? Are you cool there? Do you need, like, some grape nuts or something? Are we good? Mm -hmm. There are noises from Nell's room. The door's banging like somebody's trying to get out. And Cotton opens the door, and Nell is scrunched into a corner on top of her dresser. Yeah, let's not forget, though, that while she's banging around in that room and you hear all these noises, the fucking recorder is playing. Yeah, it is. The creepiest <laughs> fucking thing. And it's all, like, broken up and off-key, and it sounds like she's trying to play it while she's getting the shit beat out of her. It's awful. Cotton gets her down off of the top of the dresser, which, fuck. How did she fucking get up there? We have no idea. But once he gets her down, she punches him in the stomach and just runs. And when they find her, she's outside contorting, like Cirque du Soleil contorting. And something that, yeah, something I really like about this sequence is after all the racket of her being slammed against the door and the recorder playing and just that terrifying sequence. There are moments in between the scary bits where it's just dead silent and it's so dark and all you can hear are the cicadas outside and you're like, oh, bitch, <laughs> you are in the South. It's so real. Yeah, it's so you, were, you were way back real. Yeah. Cotton and the film crew look for Nell, and they finally find her on the front steps of the house. Blood all over the front of her nightgown or dress, whatever. Lewis, in his religious fervor, shoots at them. Lewis got a gun. <laughs> and then panic. And then panic because he herds them into the kitchen, and while Lewis is holding them all at gunpoint, Cotton says, okay, fine, I will do another exorcism. Jeez, what do you, don't shoot me. It's a shotgun exorcism, boys and girls. <laughs> now it's a party. Oh, and Cotton says, I agreed to do this exorcism to save children. Now I'm going to get one killed. Mm -hmm. Oh, this whole thing just makes my spine contract. God damn. Uh, like nails? Huh? Like nails? Yes. <laughs> Since I can't make that sound. <laughs> Thank God. We are back in the barn for the second exorcism of Nell Sweetser. She's chained up around the ankle. Lewis has a gun trained on everybody. Nell really wants that demon out of her. Now, while Cotton's talking to Nell, the demon comes back, and she contorts, and bones crack, and she gets her head, like, fucking perpendicular to her shoulder. It's terrible. It's awful to watch, just the, uh, people should not move like that. She's like... They should not. And Cotton starts going on reading his scripture and talking and talking and talking, and she just goes, words, 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 words. Yeah, because she says she's Abilam. She somehow has taken the bullshit from Cotton's book and internalized it. So now she's Abilam, and she does that weird fucking I'm talking backwards thing, and she's doing all the stuff you expect from possessed people. But she tells Cotton, if he can keep quiet for 10 seconds, then he'll let the girl go. Yep. So Cotton says, that's fine. I can do that. And Nell's like, one. And she breaks one of her own fingers. Two. And she breaks another finger. And it's Christing awful. It's just, yeah. oh, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. 
And so then, Marcus is like, nope. Cut yeah. Marcus is like, nope, can't do this. We got to stop. And then Nell makes the mistake of asking Cotton if he wants a blowing job. <laughs> And that's when Cotton knows. He's like, tell me what that is. You don't know what that is. <laughs> and we're all like, oh, really? You're an innocent little girl, Cotton yeah. says. Yeah, she's like, she, he's, ugh, I'm sorry, freaking out, reliving that no, in my head. It's okay, yeah. So Cotton is like, you don't know what it is because you're an innocent little girl. And that's when Nell dissociates and starts flipping out. And, sh- and shouting, she's not innocent, she's not innocent, and she just curls up into a ball and covers her head. So the next day, we realize Nell is really suffering from shame. And Cotton says, after conversation with Nell, that Nell says she got pregnant by some kid at the local cafe named Logan. And Nell starts talking in third person. And she's like, now she asked him, do you think I'm pretty? And he said, you're so pretty. And then he had a car, and then they had sex. And she's she's not acknowledging her role in that interaction. She keeps it third person. But she's not using the demon voice, and that makes it even more freaky to me. She's mm-hmm. just completely removed herself from that situation. Nell says that she gave consent to Logan to have sex with her despite Lewis's repeated statements that Nell was raped. However, Lewis does admit that there is a boy who works at the cafe, so at least that much is true. Mm-hmm. Cotton being... Cotton. <laughs> yeah, Cotton being Cotton, and at least somewhat responsible in this situation, he calls Pastor Manley to come to the farm. And Pastor Manley brings Becky. Woo! <laughs> and Lewis, to his credit, he greets both Manly and Becky very warmly, and they pray for Nell. And that's it. So Cotton and his crew are headed out of town, but they see the sign for the cafe, and they go inside to talk to Logan, who is allegedly the father of Nell's baby. Logan says that he met Nell at Pastor Manley's house at a party that he threw the summer before, but Logan, he's gay. Pipe bomb. Why is Pastor Manley throwing a party for 16-year-olds? That's a good damn question. So Cotton goes back to the Sweetser farm because some shit's going on. And yep, as- turn this fake Jesus fan around, boys. <laughs> Go back to the Sweetser farm. <laughs> so Cotton and the film crew enter the house and there are satanic symbols painted all over the walls. Also, and this is hilarious to me, <laughs> the Triketra and the Anarchy symbol are still associated with Satanism by the general public. It's Louisiana, dude! They don't know! <laughs> I mean, you got, the, you got the 666, you got the upside-down pen, but this is obviously a really well-organized, backwoods, satanic cult <laughs> that just hasn't kept up with the times. They're still working on, like, 80s satanic panic guidelines, and that's how they do shit. And it's fucking, it's funny, but at the same time, it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> These people really believe this shit? Cotton hears noises outside. They can hear Nell screaming off in the distance, so they go running around. They're looking for her, and eventually they come upon literally a satanic ritual. Yeah, I love this. They have this huge bonfire going, and, you know, one of the first things you're told or you're taught that when you begin working in sacred circles is that electronics are going to malfunction if you bring them in that space. Your camera is going to take weird pictures. Your your watch is going to stop working. So as, as they get closer and closer to this clearing in the woods where the bonfire is, Dave's camera starts glitching in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody did some fucking research on this. <laughs> Something. I mean, <laughs> there are people who would tell you that the ending of this movie falls apart. I disagree with that 
wholeheartedly. I think it pulls it together. It pulls together the first and the second act, for sure. Certain. Cotton and the film crew are, like, off in the bushes watching the satanic ritual. Lewis is tied to a tree or some shit. So blindfolded, they, even. They Well, no, is he blind? No, he's not blindfolded. Yes. Is yes, he? Yes, he is. Mm-hmm. He's got a gag in his mouth. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. No, I don't even think he was gagged. I know he was blindfolded, though. I might have to go and check you on that, because I think he was watching the whole thing, which made it even worse. Okay. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. But... There's fire. There's a huge bonfire. Nell is on an altar with her legs spread apart like she's about to give birth. And the person... Ooh! It's Becky! <laughs> Becky's the satanic doula... Down between her legs. ...for this ride. And the high priest for this satanic ritual is Pastor Manley. And he's in this bitchin' red cloak that you know he didn't pick up at J.C. Penny. Becky pulls the demon baby out of Nell. It is not human. And they all yell, Hail Abilam! And they throw the baby into the fire. And the fire just plumes up like the end of the car. It's just huge. Yeah. Big fire. And Cotton gets his balls back and he girds his loins and he goes stomping towards the satanic ritual with a cross in one hand. And he's like, you will not take this innocent baby. You're going to do all this. And he gets his faith back in that second. He goes forth to try to save Nell because, you know, he wants to save a kid. So that's what he's doing. But you don't really see how he ends up. We have a pretty good idea, but we don't really see how that ends. But meanwhile, the film crew gets the hell out of Dodge. They take off running. Iris, the one who gave Nell the boots, she gets taken down by some cultists and they chop her to fucking pieces. And the cameraman keeps running and running and running until he runs directly into Caleb, who is weirdly wearing a linen suit and a bandage across his face. And he pulls out a sickle and he cuts the cameraman's head off and the camera goes tumbling. And that's it. Redneck boy dressed up for church. Bye bye. Everybody dies. This resonates so hard with me. (laughs) But it doesn't make me have no questions, because here's my last question about uh, while we're breaking shit down. To you, Cootie Bug, was yes. Nell actually possessed? She was carrying some kind of non-human child. We saw that, and they yanked it from her body and tossed it into the flames. But that doesn't mean she was possessed. Rosemary Waterhouse had Adrian, the devil's baby, but she was not possessed. That's true. Was Nell but possessed? She, well, but um, Rosemary didn't didn't really show any signs of being possessed either. I think that Nell was possessed. I think that's how the baby was conceived. Not actually through being fucked by a demon, but through the demon possessing her and germinating that seed in her womb. So it's kind of like a anti-immaculate conception? Yeah, kind of like that. Okay. Okay, that's fair. I just want to know what you thought about that, because... I still have not made up my mind about that. But That's it's, fair. It's fucking creepy, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, well, that ending where suddenly we're shown that everything is disturbingly real has been the subject of some controversy. I mean, some people really hated it. Horror writer Paul Tremblay said, see the last exorcism, but don't see its dumbass ending. But some people, myself included, really enjoyed that ending. I thought it was shocking and and bizarre. The movie currently holds a rating of 63 on Metacritic. Who ever the fuck pays attention to Metacritic? I don't fucking know what that is. Well, a lot of the things that we had been led to believe were a bunch of bullshit during the movie got flipped around during that conclusion, and it worked for me. I mean, I know it leaves some questions unanswered, but so do a lot of movies that I love dearly. Hello? Has anyone seen City of the Living Dead? And the ending isn't so ambiguous as to piss me off. I mean, I, I can't stand these fucking movies that just sort of fizzle out. Most of the horror movies described as art house horror do that to me, and it just makes my eyes roll. But this ending... There's fucking devil worshippers. There's fire. 
there's a fucking demon baby. I mean, things like that certainly meet my requirements for a good horror film. If I haven't made it quite clear, The Last Exorcism is a movie that I love. <laughs> I think it's smart. I think it's clever and well-made. And I think Patrick Fabian is the absolute king of this flick. This movie should have made him a fucking movie star. I'm amazed that it didn't because he manages to bring humanity and personality nuance. He gives his character layers when really Cotton Marcus is no better than a shitty used car salesman. That's all he is, but he makes you concerned about him. You understand why he's doing what he's doing, and he brings it all to life in such an amazing way that I think is one of the best pieces of acting I've ever seen in my life. I'm done now. Very sorry, but I had to go off about that performance because, man, sold me. Fuck yeah. Well, do you think anybody else agrees with that assessment? I have no idea. I know The Last Exorcism made, like, over $67 million at the global box office against a budget of less than $2 million? Yeah, but as we've said before, just because it made a lot of money doesn't mean it's good. Oh, uh, well, hell. You want to make a phone call? I mean, that seems to be the way the things go. We just make that phone call and hope to hell that whoever picks up has seen The Last Exorcism and can talk somewhat intelligently about it. Right on, then. Well, hand me the pink princess phone that elicits madness, and I'll reach out and wallop someone. Crack your knuckles, acolytes. It's time to punch those touch-tone buttons and make a call on the landline of the damned. Hold on to your ringtones. It's time to dial 666, the number of the geeks. Hello? Hey, everybody. That's fantastic. Thank you. Look, this is the creator of the Chiller Pop film blog and a really, really good friend of the show, Rolf Pickler. Rolf, thanks for picking up the landline of the damn, buddy. Well, thank you both very much for having me on. I need to know, first of all, what did you think of The Last Exorcism? Ah, what did I think? Let's, Take, let's, let's, have let's a, grab a drink. <laughs> Let's have a seat, grab a drink. This is going to take a while. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's narrow this down. Um, a lot of the exorcism movies that we've talked about on this show involve Catholics. There's a young priest. There's an old priest. There's potentially a, a middle-aged priest. The Last Exorcism doesn't have any of that. So what did you think of the movie and its complete and utter lack of Catholic overtones? So, one, I thought that was great. I thought that's terrific. Um Full disclosure, I am a cultural and genetic papist, not a practicing one. So I thought it was really refreshing, really cool to see it from the kind of, uh, would you call Cotton an evangelical? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I would call Cotton yeah. an evangelical charismatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I thought that was really interesting. There's a great book out there. I'm going to recommend this to your readers. It's called American Exorcism by a guy named Michael Cuneo. And that book goes into the evangelical exorcism cottage industry, which, as, as you guys know, since you've done the show and you cover this a lot on your news segments, um, it's, it's, it's a big industry, and it drives a lot of money. Oh, yeah. You said it was called American Exorcism, was exorcism. that right? Exorcism, yeah. Okay. In, in answer to your larger question... I love this movie very much, but it frustrates the hell out of me, and I'm hoping to get into that with you. Why? Because it starts out as one thing, and it starts as, out as a really fascinating, really compelling thing, which is this man, uh, what's his name, Cotton? Yes, he Cotton is, Marcus. As in Cotton yeah, Manor. Is, yeah. Right. Not too obvious, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Cotton is out to debunk himself. I'm really charmed by him. I think his whole journey to where he's at faith-wise and what he's trying to do, I could have had a movie just about that. Yeah. And now you both know me very well. I am. I love me a satanic cult. I think 
every movie should have a satanic cult in it. And I'm sorry, are we, are we doing spoilers right now? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So you can even say I am Mr. Satanic Cults, but I'm not sure I wanted one in this movie. Oh. And I'm still conflicted about it upon rewatching it. I mean, this is probably the fourth time I've seen it, and I'm still not sure that I wanted that satanic cult in there. That's interesting right. because yeah. Pewdie and I both really, really liked that ending. We thought it pulled mm-hmm. together a lot of, of elements, not to mention just the pure here's a shocking thing for the last 10 minutes of the movie, which works really well on a horror movie level. I can kind of see what you're saying about it not fitting in with, like, let's say, a character study of Cotton. Mm-hmm. But we have to remember that the movie itself is, although it's incredibly grounded in practices and reality that, that we're familiar with, it's still a piece of fiction. So I think that worked, I think that ending worked great. What I didn't understand was why there was a sequel that you would call The Last Exorcism Part 2, because that makes no sense. <laughs> the, right. the next last exorcism. <laughs> Wait, there was a sequel? Are you fucking kidding me? There sure was, Cootie. I didn't need to know that. <laughs> you just... I, I think I just died a little inside. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I like... I like it for the sheer fact that it completely changed the movie. Like it went off the fucking rails and it was fun for me. It was just this, it was unexpected. Like it, so, and I think that because just because of the nature of the type of films that we really like and that we like to cover, um, it kind of just fell back on, it felt nostalgic to me. Right. You know, I think, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I think you guys are right. This is this was billed as a supernatural horror movie. That's kind of what it had to be. Mm-hmm. At some point, we had to get a twist to make something either be real or, or be like some sort of a, a conspiracy. But here's the thing. I don't know what you guys thought, but I loved Cotton. I thought he was a terrific character. In a lot of these middle of the road exorcism movies that have come out since the exorcism of Emily Rose, I feel like we've gotten, you know, just very trite religious characters that are just like, I've lost my faith. Oh, mm-hmm. I lost my faith. Like just, just, you know, just to have a, a priest that has lost their faith because they did in the exorcism. So that's part of the ingredient. Mm-hmm. But with cotton, you get a whole journey as to why he's lost his faith. And then you get him trying to debunk himself, which I really, I was so charmed and so like moved by that. And the other thing I was thinking about is the, when you guys, you know, especially in your early episodes, when you guys do the Satan in the news segments, you guys are talking about a lot of these sort of sham exorcists. You're covering what they're doing in the news. More often than not, what they're doing is actually harmful Um, So I was really loving that vibe of Cotton kind of almost repenting for what he was doing. Do do you know what I mean? Yeah, he was kind of trying to, um, I guess, make amends in some way by by uncovering what a sham it is or, you know, how he's been faking it. And yeah, no, I totally get that. It was almost like he was trying to absolve himself through that action. Did you think the end? when he rushed in to attempt to save Nell, was that him regaining his faith or was that him just trying to save the life of a child, which he alluded to earlier in the film? Well, see, that's interesting because the thing is when, when he got to Nell, he kept the facade going, even though he exposed himself in the documentary, he kept the facade going because there's also the, the, this idea that exorcism or some sort of like a religious ritual can be a bit of a placebo, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Cotton was very self-aware. Now he gets to the ritual and he sees a a giant demon coming out of the fire and a little baby Abadam. Abalam? Abalam. Bamalam. Sure. Bamalam. Whoa, Black Betty. (laughs) Abalam. He sees these things and, I mean, does it work? Like that, that all of a sudden he's like, oh, yeah, there's demons. Okay, got to go do my job. Got to go do what I do. 
Well, he did say well, himself that if you believe in the devil, you have to believe in God. So I think that all is, of a sudden presented with that proof positive, he was just like, oh, well, shit. OK, <laughs> <laughs> no arguing against this. <laughs> Got to go do what I do. Yeah. And honestly, like Cotton had a good heart overall. Like, you, you know, he, he might have come across as a, bit, a little bit smarmy, a little bit, you know, fast talking. But I think he had a good heart. And he yeah. Oh, he was talking as hell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was. Let's clarify this. Do you think that exorcism can be a helpful thing? I know some people say it's a great tool to help people overcome certain things like shame. You know, I can only speak for our culture, right? Because we're very woke on the show. Uh, <laughs> I can only speak to what I've been seeing of exorcism in in the sort of like in the Roman Catholic Church and in these these kind of evangelical circles. You guys have covered it a lot, um, along with Cindy, may she rest in power. Um, but a lot of I, I don't know that it releases shame as so much as it reinforces it. Um, we've seen these exorcisms trying to drive the gay out of people. We've seen like all these just just horrible kind of shameful things. Um, you know, you cover the news about our good buddy Pat Robertson, and uh, what's the other guy, Bob Larson? <sighs> Two men who are trash, right? And who use these sort of deliverances and exorcisms to just really awful ends. I know this is a long-winded answer, but yes, I do believe that it can work as, as that kind of placebo, that kind of like psychological relief. You know, other cultures in this world have, I mean, for some other cultures, possession is actually a sacrament, right? It's, it's a way to commune with, with your gods and to, to kind of receive that divine connection. Right. So there's no right or wrong answer, but I think from what we perceive from our own culture kind of what's going on around us the, the type of stuff that you guys report on um i don't know that it's healthy or good that's interesting because we i did not really actually think of that until you just said it like i didn't think of it from that perspective that it doesn't really release shame as much as reinforce it so like on the yeah. short term okay you've got this very religious person who feels like um they've been you know absolved of this issue or whatever and now this demon is gone and okay they can go on with their life but they're still it doesn't erase what happened or what caused that sense of shame and the religious structure as a whole um just kind of it, it remains intact because they're still within that. So, yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. Excuse me. I think yeah. that's I think that's also a reason why when you're in one of those churches, you'll see the same people going back up to the altar week after week for the same shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, how long does this have to go on? Why didn't this work? Because <laughs> <laughs> then. Because then, you know, you, you another problem pops up during the week and you're like, oh, got to go get rid of that. If you guys don't mind, I have a few questions for you. Absolutely. Okay. Fire. So I've been thinking about the plot, right? And I'm thinking, OK, so turns out that uh, Nell's dad, right, is, Lewis. is I mean, Lewis was, uh, you know, he was a religious man. He was he was holy rolling, but he wasn't a bad man. He still loved his daughter. He was not the he was not the hidden culprit here. He didn't rape her. He didn't you know, he just pulled her out of a Sunday school, which turned out to be a goddamn satanic cult. <laughs> <laughs> so what was Caleb Landry Jones's deal there? <laughs> was he the high priest of Abraham? Did he was he like the surrogate father of this child, like of the demon? Like what? I know we don't have any clear answers, and I don't actually remember if Last Exorcism 2 answered that question. I saw it, and I found it very forgettable. But what do you think went on there? I think he was more of her protector as far as within the cult goes, and that's why he was so belligerent towards Cotton and the film crew when they showed up. If anybody's the huh. high priest, it's Pastor Manley, and Pastor Manley's got stuff going through his church so 
much like you know, the Brotherhood of Satan, uh, there's that yeah. cult within the small town, and it's all based from that church. That's that's how yeah. I, that's how I saw it. Yeah, I felt like Caleb was just like muscle. He was kind of like this guard dog set to watch over now. I also think like, what does this demon want? It's got its cult around it, but Nell is, you know, she's possess- when she's possessed, she lashes out. I mean, she cuts that motherfucker in the face. She's she's lashing out at everybody around her. Like, does the demon, is it working for the cult or is it kind of looking out for Nell? Like, these are these are weird questions that come up. I've been, as I read so much about exorcism movies that um, I always think about, like, whether the possession kind of gives voice to the possessed person's kind of frustrations or anger or like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you have a sense of what I'm talking about here, but what do you think? Again, that raises the question of whether Nell was actually possessed. Right. Because I'm not positive that she was. It's like Cotton ah. said in the movie. It's like Cotton said, you know, a demon would know what a blowing, what a blow job is and wouldn't call it <laughs> by the wrong name. So, right. yeah, not sure if she was actually possessed. However, she certainly did act out. So that's that's something interesting to ponder. Yeah, she cut the fuck out of Caleb's face. Good Lord. I'm sure she was having like some kind of freak out, like psychosis going on because she was carrying this demon baby. <laughs> she could not have been, you know, really well on the mental health side of things. But I think I think that yeah. that that brings up a good point because from the exorcism movies that we have watched we've learned two things demons want two things they want chaos and they want babies yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's very true and i don't know why they want babies but these are the most quiver movement entities that i've ever seen in a movie They've obviously never had to get up for 3 a.m. feeding, so I mean, what, what, what the fuck, demons? That's why you. That's why you have cultists. <laughs> the cultists do that shit. Let the fucking Duggars take care of the demon baby. <laughs> Hand it off to Laura Louise. <laughs> that. Listen, Cootie, you say that, but come on, let's talk about Becky for a second. Oh. Was she or was she not a discount Laura Louise? She so was, and I never made that connection. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Ah, shut up with your old gods. <laughs> Don't put it in the milk. It, 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 it'll go bad. Oh. It, it's just, it'll be awful. Oh, my God. That's really funny. It's true. She was. And I loved how she was like, oh, am I going to be in a documentary? Oh, how nice. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> she was the breakout star of that movie. I am convinced. <laughs> For the entire three minutes she was in it. <laughs> Did we ever get a clear connection between her and Pastor Manley? Were, were they married? Was she just the church secretary? I have no idea. I don't think they made that clear. I mean, obviously she she was the midwife. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was just kind of like the busybody administrator. Yeah. <laughs> the one who who would snatch your your donuts away at the church social if you had more than one. Uh, <laughs> why would Nell blame Logan for fathering the child when she was obviously not his type? What? <laughs> I found that interesting too because first of all, um, when she did all of her crazy killing the cat and killing the priest drawings, there was obviously a prophetic quality to that. That's that's hanging the gun on the wall, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So was the idea to kind of lure them into this wicker man-ish trap of some sort, or just that this is their predetermined fate, and we just ha- we just know that this is where this was all going to end up, with them butchered and, and, and little demon baby rising up? <laughs> I figured it was predetermined. Because if if it is your first option, like you said, and Logan was just like the the red herring that they figured out in order to go back to the farm, yeah, that's really elaborate. <laughs> that's a very convoluted plan. Yeah, I'm not so sure I trust the characters in that movie to come up with something that clever and 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 that right. that has so much machination to it. So I don't think they were meant to go back. 
I mean, Caleb didn't even want them to, to come to the farm to begin with. Yeah. It's kind of like when you plan a birthday party and then people from that other side of the family show up and you didn't even invite them. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's true. And then you just want to whack them with a scythe. <laughs> Chop them into pieces. Here's your piece of cake. Get yeah. the fuck out. <laughs> Yeah, which, you know, just kind of brings me back to Caleb himself. And there's something very children of the corn about him. I almost feel like he was kind of the brains, not the brains behind the cult, but kind of a real driving force oh, somehow. Yeah. Or, or was or was he abusing now? Well, trying to pin it on his dad would have been a good cover for that. And that's honestly what we all thought. I thought it was headed that way, right? Because the dad, here's the thing. The dad was so invested in Nell's purity and virginity, right? He freaked out when he, when, you know, he found out she was pregnant. He's like, my daughter is a virgin. She is pure. Yeah. So a lot of questions. And this is why I love the movie and it frustrates you at the same time. I think some <laughs> doesn't need to answer everything, but uh, there's just, it, it's a rich movie. It really is. Yeah. How did you like Nell as a character? And to get like an annoying English teacher, compare and contrast Nell with Reagan. Oh, wow. Well, we have an immediate problem with that because um, I hated Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a character, I couldn't stand that little kid. I hated when she was trying to leave the... Well, no, when she's, I don't know what to say, making the tape recordings for her dad. I don't know. I like horses. You know, of course you do. We've seen Equus. <laughs> I just didn't like her at all. I thought she was whiny and annoying, and she didn't get interesting to me until she pissed on the floor during the party. <laughs> that brought out her true personality. I think so. <laughs> now the thing about Nell is she was obviously a very a very sweet human. Yeah. But she wasn't so sweet that I wanted to strangle her to make her shut the fuck up. <laughs> I didn't hate her. She wasn't that sort of American girl darling, <laughs> you know. She yeah. she seemed real to me. She seemed very very real and the things that she went through were more awful so much for syntax um but yeah the things that happened to her just seem more terrible because she was just a genuinely nice person yeah and cootie what do you think i did not hate reagan but um i don't know i think they i think both of those characters and the way the actresses portrayed those characters just seemed real to me for like their age and kind of their yeah. background. So, you know, Reagan is this, what was she, like 11, 12, supposedly, in the movie, something like that. Just privileged as fuck, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And she was, I thought she was a cute kid. And then right. Nail seemed like she pulled off this 16-year-old girl to be somebody that's obviously been shielded um yep. and kept away from the secular world in general so she seemed kind of regressed like she wasn't quite as mature as what right. you would expect from a 16 year old girl um but i loved loved the actress that played Nell. i thought she just fucking was stellar i thought her performance in that film was great but it kind of yeah. it, it kind of begs the question like how do demons decide who to possess <laughs> <laughs> right i think uh, i think there's that very narrow window of opportunity right you gotta catch whoever's on the ouija board at, at any given time <laughs> <laughs> they might have to take a number like at the grocery store <laughs> They're, They're on like that in the wait waiting list. room, like on a Beetlejuice, just sitting there waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on hold for 30 years. Yeah. Because <laughs> it makes sense to me that a demon would be like, I'd like to find the most innocent human being that I can, wiggle my way in there, and just fuck some shit up. Now, I, I get that. But at the same time, doesn't it seem like a demon would head towards just the most nastiest trashiest person that they could find because they're already open to that shit right 
Well, probably not because they their whole thing is wanting to despoil what's pure and nice and lovely, right? I mean, that was that was the whole point of The Exorcist. And that's what made me kind of ask that question because really Reagan is not really a character in either the novel or the film. She's just meant to be this sweet little girl doing sweet little girl things. And all of a sudden she becomes this demon that, you know, kind of masturbates and, and has all these scatological gross things. So it's kind of like William Peter Blatty. This is my opinion. Everyone's going to at me about this, but William Peter Blatty can't conceive of a female character with any sort of, even, even a young girl with any sort of conflicts or rage or things that are bestial and horrible in their uh. mind. Right. Yeah. Whereas I, I do think William Friedkin was able to sort of telegraph that a little because both of the movies have to set up, what do you call it, just kind of this tension whether of are they or are they not possessed. The Last Exorcism did that much better because everything that happens during the possession scenes can have a plausible non-supernatural explanation. There's no rotating heads, no telekinesis. Right. There's, there's just really scary kind of acting out. I, I, I also was really charmed by Nell. I think you're right, Cootie. She was kind of a character that's that's sweet and sheltered, and you know misses her mom. Like, like you really felt that 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 pain that she had about losing her mom, mm -hmm. and you felt you felt her dad's pain about losing the mom. Which is something I didn't it, pick up with with Reagan about her father being away and her parents getting divorced. Yeah. Even in that scene where Chris McNeil's on the phone trying to get a hold of her dad long distance and arguing with the operator, it just seemed like Reagan kind of raised her head a little bit and then was like, eh, fuck it, I'm going back to sleep. I thought that, that little moment there gives you just enough to think like, okay, maybe she's acting out about this whole thing. With Nell, I just feel like, you know, if you think about it long enough, and you're not just watching this movie to for the horror thrills. You think like, okay, so she's let's see, she's she's the sheltered kid in rural Louisiana. Her dad pulled her out of out of school to homeschool her. There's possibly some abuse going on. She's she's got a lot of religious guilt and conflicts in her mind. Like when puberty hits, what's going to happen to this girl when when she starts having conflicts about like thinking about the world or getting angry or or, or experiencing like the things that adolescents do? What's going to happen to this girl? So isolation is a big part of that for now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And again, that's also why the movie is frustrating, <laughs> as I say, because you've got this really nice journey with Cotton where you think, okay, he's going to actually turn this around, turn around this 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 kind of holy rolling, guilt-inducing exorcism thing that he does, and maybe good will come out of that. But no, by the end, there actually are demons. There actually are satanic cults. It's almost bringing it back to being very religious and be religious. Mm. That's a really good point. The Last Exorcism works on a grand scale because viewers desperately want it to have a happy ending. We got the happy ending yeah. with The Exorcist. Yeah. So Well, if you can yeah. count that as a fucking happy ending. Well, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> at least, you know, partially happy. <laughs> We know two priests died and one shitty movie director, but yeah, that was happy. Great. <laughs> but yeah, I think that I think that's a really big reason why it works. We want things to work out for Nell. We want her to come out of her religion induced almost catatonic state and it, yeah. and it just and it just doesn't happen. And for me, that's a gut punch. Yeah. Yeah. She's just yeah. she she's stuck. She's stuck like Chuck. It's a, you've said you you like and are frustrated by this movie at the same time. Is this a movie that you'd recommend like to our viewers? Would you say yeah, fuck yeah, check this out or mm, pass? I definitely would. Yeah. I definitely would recommend it. Mrs. Pickler, she she knows my love of horror movies and demon movies. She's a little sick of the exorcism movies. She thinks they're lame and boring. <laughs> but she was actually really captivated by this movie until the exorcism hit. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, not the exorcism, the 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 cult scene. Oh, okay. Until the very end. And she was like, are you kidding me? This could have been such a good movie if, you know, they had just stuck with basically what I told you. All that aside, whether you do or don't love exorcism and devil movies, I would tell you absolutely watch this movie. I think it's terrific. I really do. Okay, before we do anything else... <laughs> Okay. I want to jump back to one of the funniest scenes. Okay, maybe the only funny scene in The Last Exorcism. Since we're here in the kitchen, 
I thought it would be fun to actually make the banana bread recipe that Cotton Marcus sneaks into his sermon in the first act of the movie. <laughs> Holy hell, that sounds totally fun. Well, I mean, except our listeners can't see it or smell it or put their fingers on it. Well, that's where things get interesting. Look, I might be old, but that doesn't mean I'm afraid of technology. I've been known to take a drive down the information superhighway every once in a while, fire up the CompuServe, log into a BBS. I'll even jump on AOL Instant Messenger when it's a wild night. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, I'm, I'm kidding. Look, we'll post a video of this craziness on various social media outlets, including our old YouTube channel. Wait, we have a YouTube channel? Yeah, man. But everything on it's black and white, and it's silent. Ass. So no worries. You'll get full video of this within 48 hours of when this episode drops. Jeez, 48 hours? Well, it's going to take me that long to figure out how to edit and upload everything. Okay, that's fair. Let's head into the kitchen and make some goddamn banana bread. Okay, now the first thing that it says is you take two ripe bananas... And you put them in bowl. Okay. So, I think these are ripe. Mostly ripe. They're ripe-ish. I like my bananas to be a little riper when I make banana bread, but... That's fine. We're going to go with this. Okay. Okay, so put them in a bowl. Well, that's... I mean... That's a bowl. Like, do I need to chop them up or anything? It doesn't say. I don't even know if you need to peel them. It doesn't say to peel them. <laughs> It just says you take two ripe bananas and put them in a bowl. All right, so, okay, bananas are in the bowl. Okay, and then we add some sugar. Add some sugar? That's what's that, yeah. Oh, okay, well, let's find some sugar. Oh, yeah, here we go. you take two ripe bananas, put them in a bowl, <laughs> put some sugar. Put some sugar. It doesn't specify how much sugar. It doesn't say how much, it just says sugar. So I'm just to use my best guesstimation on the... Amount of sugar. Um, do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do as far as sugar. Yeah, he must be on vacation. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> okay. All right. That seems good. All right. Did you, you okay? Yeah. I'm getting some sugar cloud going on here. <laughs> okay. All right. What's the next step? Well, we put it in the oven and bake it for 400. Don't you think that maybe we should put it in some oven safe? It doesn't. Container? It doesn't say that. It's, it's it doesn't different. say 400 what either. It could be 400 degrees. Could be 400 minutes. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, fuck it. Put it in. All right. Yay! 400. Let's see if we get some banana bread. The timer. I don't. It, it doesn't say how long. 400 minutes. 400 I don't know. Minutes. Set a timer for 400 minutes. Six hours and 40 minutes. Starting now. This is going to be bad. It's a long time for banana bread to cook. Six hours and 40 minutes. Yeah, let's see it. Okay. I'm amazed we didn't burn the house down. Well, I need yeah. a pot holder. I was going to say, hold on. I got you. I got you. All right. Okay. Banana bread, the Cotton Marcus way. Where the hell did the banana pepper come from? It's banana bread. This is bad. I, I, I don't want to eat that. Well, that shit didn't work. Did that even count as a recipe? I really think Cotton's directions were perhaps missing some elements. Fuck. Well, how do you do the banana breading? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we should probably ask somebody who actually knows how to make it. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? If brown cows give chocolate milk, why don't dark clouds rain Jägermeister? No. Well, I, I wasn't thinking that at all. Mm. No, I believe we should see if we can score an actual recipe for banana bread, not only for us, but for our acolytes as well. <gasps> call Al! Yeah? Do it! Call Al! You got it. 
Welcome to a new segment here on KTG, Recipes from Hell with Alan McPherson. So Al, welcome back to the show. Very, very happy to have you here with your own little digs, your niche your, my corner your corner your segment my cubby <laughs> but i have to say we went through and um we tried to make banana bread the way the cotton marcus told us to make banana bread and it was a disaster it did not go well so I'm sure we'll go to that here in a minute. But first, I want to know, mm-hmm. what did you think of The Last Exorcism? I like a lot of The Last Exorcism. And it's one of those I've seen it a few times up up until like this rewatch. And every time I watch it, I kind of get this like, why don't I think about this movie more? Why do I kind of like regulate this to like a eh, it's a B plus kind of a thing? Um, I like it, but it's not like top of the list. And then I start watching. It's like, oh, this is really good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and there's a lot going on here. This should be like a, a tippy tippy top movie for me. And then things start happening. And it's like, oh, OK, now I get why I don't. And basically, I think it does a lot of things really, really well. But then there's a bunch of stuff that I think it kind of like drops down quite a bit on. Um. I think this is one of those movies that was a found footage movie that shouldn't have been one or should have been like a blended, like a Leslie Vernon kind of a thing. Mm. You know, like. mm-hmm. See, my only disagreement with that is that the sequel to The Last Exorcism, which should never have existed, completely yeah. ditched the found footage format and became a standard kind of third person omniscient f- film. And it mm-hmm. it really didn't work. It it no, that, really didn't work. That movie was just like the second last exorcism or whatever it was. That was all about the punchline of that. And that was like an hour and a half to get you to the like the, the final moment, which did not justify its existence in any way, shape or form. Um, but I love the pseudo documentary stuff with Cotton as a character study of him. I thought that was great. I thought that was real, you know, that there's some really interesting stuff with that character at that point of his life. Like he's someone who's not completely reformed. He's kind of trying to sort of reform, maybe trying to use this documentary to reform, because if he puts it out in the public, what he is, he can't really backtrack anymore. Yeah. Uh, And that's I love all of that stuff. But then when they it's funny enough, it's like the horror bits or the uh, are the parts where it kind of lets me down a little bit on that. Like when you have the fake documentary things and there's actual soundtrack and stinger music in it, that's a little, that's a little bridge too far. It's one of these, like I can't judge a movie too much based on repeat viewings. And that's not entirely fair. Like some things work the first time you see them and that's all they're supposed to. And that's great. Um, but watching this multiple times, like I find the scare bits, the, uh, spooky running around in the house and that kind of stuff. I find myself waiting for that to get over so we can get back to the character stuff and back to the sort of the mystery side of it, which I think is this film's uh, strongest part. That's interesting. But uh, it, it does like it's, it pulls some neat tricks in that it really references a lot of other movies that everybody knows. Like there's like obviously nods to like Rosemary's baby, uh, the omen, low hanging fruit the wicker man you know like like a lot of these sort of like classics of like uh satan pagan butting up against sort of like mainstream christian society kind of stuff any of you the bonfire (laughs) (laughs) s'mores yeah Uh, (laughs) but uh you give disney a year that's gonna happen uh Polly shore is s'mores um, it, but it, it does a nice to like because at no point you're thinking like it's derivative of those films or like trying to rip them off. It's it right. It uses it nicely as touchstones. 
the closest thing that I found distracting, actually, to it reminding me of was an episode of The X-Files. Funny enough, it was one of my favorite episodes of The X-Files, I think probably around season four, where there's one of... Yeah, th- there's one of the few like Satan themed episodes where it's like this small town where they're kind of the sort of like religion of the town is a satanic cult, but they're very like wishy washy, um, kind of like United Church version of Satan worshiper mm. worshipers, and they just kind of do it. They just do the rituals. They don't really take it seriously. It's just what they do. But the devil doesn't really take kindly to that. But anyway, there's a whole thing in that with there's sort of Armstone preacher who is like sort of the red herring for the villain. And then there's a more moderate liberal Christian preacher who turns out to be like the bigger evil. That's what happened when we started trying to do modern worship services in the church I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Because it was like, you have an acoustic guitar, you are obviously Satan. Oh, yeah. No, you get the guy who's on the altar with the acoustic guitar. He's probably wearing penny loafers. He wants to be referred to by his first name and is pulling shit like, come on, everybody, come up on the altar. This is your church, too. It's like, yeah, that's not going to go well. We can sing some blind melon tunes. It's cool. God <laughs> loves music. Ew. <laughs> So what did you think of the ending? The ending is the thing that pisses a lot of people off. Cootie and I loved it. What did you think? I don't have a problem with the ending. Uh, that yeah. That's where it had to go. Like, that's what that's we're waiting for. That's what we say. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't know a way around that. X was talking about that earlier today. He was like, how the fuck else was that going to end? Like, was the girl going to be okay? And it turned out to be a psychological issue and Cotton goes to sell real estate? Like, then it would it, it it would have been like a decent drama like it wouldn't have been a horror movie at that point no no i mean you have to pay off like you have to pay off the drawings the predictive yep and it just happens so fast like it really turns on a dime mm-hmm. like things seem relatively normal like you can question whether they should have gone to the police when maybe they thought there was some like incest going on but really, that whole last turn happens in the last 10 minutes of the film, and you yeah. don't really have a lot of time to think about it. No, I, I think that's about the best way you can end that movie. I, I would never have a problem with that. Or... I'm a big fan of tonal shifts, always have been. And this movie has that kind of from dusk till dawn, boom, just within a 16th of a second, we're going to make this movie something that you did not expect. And I love that about the last exorcism. It just, huh, just, <laughs> well, and it, I'm charmed by that weirdness. But it also, it's, it's not, it's not like completely insane either. Like it does make sense within the, you know, it has, it's one of those ones that has a bit of a tragic sense to it too. Like, you're not, like, rooting for these people to get annihilated. You don't necessarily, you're not going to weep for them necessarily. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, th- th- there is that sort of, like, Greek tragedy. You're heading to your inevitable doom. You should have kind of seen it coming. But I could see why, why you did. And it all makes sense, like, when that hammer drops right at the end. So, yeah, I, I think that's terrific. Yeah, you should have seen it coming because of Nell's fucking folk art. That looks like the... A fucking REM album cover. You should have totally guessed that. <laughs> One of the things that I liked about this, uh, watching it this time, that I hadn't picked up before, uh, there's a little bit the cr- one of the sort of cringy moment uh, bits with Nell early on, where um, she's playing recorder, yeah, and she's playing green sleeves. <laughs> But just before that, they're making a big point about how they're only listening to Christian music in the house. And, like, Greensleeves is pretty pagan as fuck, right? Like, Also, the Christians ripped off Greensleeves because there's that whole What Child Is This Christmas Carol that is... Oh, yeah. All the Christmas carols do that. Like, Yeah. Friggin' Ode to Joy has, like, been turned into a, a, a Catholic hymn. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's not exactly on brand, but, you know... Well, like I said, we we tried to make the banana bread that Cotton Marcus told us how to make in his sermon. Literally, the one of the best scenes of the movie for me. And when we tried it, we fucked it up <laughs> real bad. We did not. We followed his instructions precisely. 
<laughs> should I blame Cotton Marcus for that? Yes, you should. <laughs> Why do you think his child had, like, such medical problems? Because he, he was, like, huffing banana curbin, and that cut off some oxygen to the brain. Just some banana fetamine. Is that what it was? <laughs> that was like a, like, you have cocaine, and you have crack. You have, like, mellow yellow, you have this banana bread recipe. Oh, my God. Put a little ammonia in there, make it crystalline. <laughs> if you want to get down, get down to the ground, plantains. <laughs> Oh, man. So tell us about your banana bread recipe, which I'm sure is far better and may actually include some sort of flour, which ours did not. (laughs) All the things you would think that go into bread, we did not get that. Well, sometimes with baking, you have to take it on faith. I think think Cotton's recipe might show up in the PragerU cookbook. Um, (laughs) But... uh, uh, maybe I should pitch them on that. Yes. I think Dennis Prager would be down for that. Yeah. I want to, like, Denise D'Souza's macaroni and cheese. That would be, I, I want to see what that's like. It's just American cheese, and that's it. And and no macaroni. It's just cheese. No macaroni. Because <laughs> that comes from overseas. Yeah. <laughs> it's anti American because of Yankee Doodle. Like, well, damn immigrants brought the macaroni to the states. No. <laughs> Dave Rubin's Rubin. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Sean, banana bread. <laughs> Sean Hannity and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny enough, every recipe would just turn out to be macaroni and cheese. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and it would make those WWE cookbooks from the 90s look pretty sophisticated. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Your Stone Cold Lemon Slush. Well, no, that seems like just fucking high art. <laughs> Haute cuisine. I will never forget seeing uh, Triple H preparing swordfish in a toaster oven on Regis and Kathy Lee, like circa 98, which was... Spray it with Pam and put it in a toaster oven. I'm going to have to YouTube that shit. And Regis is making fun of him. It was uh, it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think he was wearing a shirt while doing it. But, I mean, that's I might be embellishing that. That could be just my headcanon. But. I'm stunned oh. into silence by that very concept. I don't know how to even appropriate that in my head. We'll, 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 we'll track it down. <laughs> but... Um, banana bread. Yes. That's a thing that I think everyone should kind of, like, if you're at all interested in cooking at all, everyone should have a banana bread recipe. Unless you absolutely hate bananas, but even then, a lot of banana bread, you don't even really taste the banana. It's like, it's just like a great staple thing to know how to do. One of the things that's great about it, all of the, almost all of the recipes work. Like, they're, it's not like, um, you don't need a lot of technique. You can put as much effort or as little effort into, a banana bread or cake as you want. Mm-hmm. And they're going to turn out one way or the other, you know, like unless you go crazy and leave out like key ingredients, they're almost kind of bulletproof. And every family's got their favorite banana bread recipe and they're all almost the same. Mm-hmm. It's just going to be like, whether you like them a little bit fudgier or you like them a bit more like a cake or you like them a little bit more sweet or a little less sweet and they can kind of be breakfast and they can kind of be dessert. And they don't dry out for days. Uh, it's relatively cheap, and you can feed a large group of people, you know, pretty easily with it. It's just a good thing to have in your back pocket. And people just fight about what kind of nuts you put in it. Yeah. <laughs> pecans, walnuts, pecans, walnuts. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it, but that's a great thing too. Like you throw nuts in there if you feel like it. Sure, chocolate. Yeah, that works. Um, coconut if you're down with that throw that in like it's a real blank canvas in terms of like what you can do with it you have you have leftovers it makes great french toast if you feel like you know more of a dessert it makes like a great like uh bread pudding you know it's they're just like nice to have around so 
Did you see that face? You blew his mind with the concept of banana bread French toast. Mm-hmm. That's happening now. I can see it in our future. Yeah, I'm doing that shit. <laughs> the first restaurant that I apprenticed at, that was one of our best desserts, was the banana bread pudding. Mm. We'd go out of our way, make a really nice banana bread, let it dry out, cut it into tiny little cubes, make like a chocolate pudding that we would fold that into. And it was like not the fanciest looking thing, but it was everyone loved it. We'd serve it like rum ice cream or something like that. Damn, and, dude. I just felt a humidity rise in your room, cutie. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound good from the what you've been telling me about your weather. That's uh, oh, we got the humidity. There's <laughs> a little bit more won't hurt anything. You know, well, I guess won't notice. What what I usually do, like the the one that I sent on to you, like it's pretty straightforward. It, the only little embellishment that I do, pretty much bananas. If you use eggs or not, that's kind of like up to you. You don't necessarily need it. I like buttermilk. I like buttermilk and baking, so because it gives a little bit of a tang, makes things not quite so sweet, and it helps make things lift. I like kind of caramel flavors with bananas, so I um I, I like to use a bit of brown butter rather than just straight butter with it. So it just gives it that bit more of that nutty kind of a thing. But other than that, it's like pretty straightforward. It's like you take the wet stuff, you mash the wet stuff together, then you put the dry stuff in the wet stuff, and uh, it's generally going to work. So, Do you use a self-rising flour or an all-purpose flour with the baking soda and making powder added in? Yeah, I always just have uh, all-purpose flour around. Okay. Uh, I, I generally like to go that way. Like even for bread making, uh, I use all purpose flour, but I, I keep some like vital wheat gluten around. So if I'm making like a stretchier kind of a bread, I just throw that in rather than have a bunch of different types of like uh, white flour kicking around. So what did you make the weird pseudo sausage out of? Oh, banana. Uh, is it banana? It's banana. It's they're they're so they're called saba bananas, and they're kind of like smaller than the um, general variety that we get in our grocery stores it's a it's a street food in um in the philippines that they call a banana queue and it's basically like a candied banana so basically you would like roll the banana in brown sugar let it sit in it for a while until it kind of like the moisture from the banana soaks into the sugar and it makes a bit of a crust then you heat up oil in a pan or a wok or something like that put these bananas in carefully so you don't like explode yourself (laughs) <laughs> and w- when they start to bubble, then you put more sugar into the oil and just like kind of whisk it around. And then when it turns dark, you just scoop them out. I want that so bad. <laughs> they're real good. They're, they're, <laughs> it's it's kind of like a donut. You want to get them hot, like wh- when they're like pretty quick out of the oil. They, yeah. They're not so great when you let them sit around for a bit. But um, yeah, it's like the outside is like really crispy. The, these bananas are a little starchier. They're not quite as like goopy. Okay. So that they can actually hold up to being cooked a bit. Um, so it's not like sickeningly sweet. So almost like a plantain? They're sort of in between. Like, yeah, they're not quite as like crunchy as a plantain would be. Okay. There's also like uh, green bananas that are more like, uh, that are a little bit smaller that they would work just as well. Yeah. So on the top of the banana bread, banana sausage, I was con- dude. <laughs> I was convinced you had pulled out some kind of worst <laughs> and fried it up because I saw grease on the plate on that picture, and I thought, well, that's fucking pork. How is that going to work with banana? <laughs> yeah, but then I saw the cross-section cut picture, and I was like, no, that's some kind of fucking fruit. This is a vegetable or something. This is not meat. And I was like, it's chicken sausage. That's why it's why. <laughs> <laughs> a little boudine in there or, uh, yeah, yeah something <laughs> and we're both going to fucking canadians what the hell is this <laughs> oh okay next time it's banana poutine that's that's what we're doing oh god <laughs> banana curd <laughs> so, but yeah what was the what was the thick layer of white on top because we we thought that it might be a meringue it's more it's kind of like a homemade uh, marshmallow fluff Okay. Oh, I thought it was mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's yeah, mayonnaise equal parts mayonnaise and icing sugar. <laughs> <laughs> mayonnaise. And if you have a look, 
if, if you have a little Lipitor to go with that, you're probably <laughs> better off. <laughs> mm. So it's marshmallow fluff, and it was that chocolate drizzled over the top, or Worcestershire sauce? No. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that was just more brown sugar that I just took a blowtorch to. Yeah, that's what I started to say. It looked like it was just caramelized on top. So I'll, I missed a trick. I should have put some chocolate in, and then it would have been a bit like a s'more. But uh, uh, yeah. Obviously, I cannot recognize things from far away, so. <laughs> it all comes back to s'mores. I think it, I think it does. Do you think the devil's favorite dessert is s'mores? I mean, because. Ooh, yeah. Fire. I mean. <laughs> Man, those fucking marshmallows a- are molten hot. Yeah. Yeah, you ever get like a, a bit of the uh, zippy drizzle of a uh, molten marshmallow like down in between your like your sneaker and your foot? <laughs> I have not. Yeah. I've done it between my don't. fingers. It's- <laughs> you don't. Yeah, I know. It's horrible. <laughs> People convince themselves that's fun. Nope. And it's just like burning third degree burns and like mouth damage. Yeah, no, that's, that's probably right up there. The s'mores are horrible. <laughs> it's just the worst thing you can do outside. It's just like, here, you got a stick of butter? Just put it in your fist and put it over the campfire. <laughs> that way, <laughs> the butter will melt and so will your fingers. <laughs> Little known fact, G. Gordon Liddy's favorite dessert. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they like some ores with a little bit of rat. They like to eat the rat. Uh, we're going to have to explain G. Gordon Lee to the kids sometime. Oh, I mean, fuck. That's what Wikipedia is for. Fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> Google it, bitches. <laughs> I want that as a t-shirt. Let them Google it? Yeah, Google no, it. Google it, bitches. That's the... No. We have a friend that has a t-shirt that says IDK Google it. That's as close as I've seen. <laughs> yep. Well, your banana bread certainly looks more delicious than what we uh, came up with. Seriously, it's fucking posh. That's like gourmet <laughs> banana bread. It like cuts and we... stuff. And... Well, I think the lesson learned here is um, don't follow instructions from a Baptist preacher. Especially one who's like, you know, a self-confessed fraud. That, that's like a red flag. <laughs> if I had some giant-ass playing cards to throw into the oven with it, I'd have done it. <laughs> This is the dessert of lies. <laughs> I'm ready to make a delightfully fruity quick bread. I'm ready to have more alcohol and eat banana bread. Banana bread. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you need more booze. But let's think of our consumption of alcoholic beverages as a public service. If any of you out there are getting ready to watch The Last Exorcism, you might as well get chewed up and plowed under while you're at it. It's time to play the Federated States of Micronesia's favorite drinking game, Drinking with the Devil, where your love of bad movies meets your disdain for your own liver. Full of times. <laughs> More than a handful. Oh my god. Okay. Drink! Every time you hear Nell's neck crack. <laughs> Which also happens more than a handful of times. <laughs> <laughs> Drink! Every time Miss Irene panics. <laughs> well, that leads into this one. Drink! Every time a member of the film crew suggests getting the hell away from the Sweetser farm. <laughs> Drink! Every time Cotton pretends to pray. Oh, that.
That's good. And your Grandmaster Challenge for the last exorcism, drink! Every time the bags under Ashley Bell's eyes get larger. Oh my god, that's like every five minutes. Her eyes just continue to sink back into her head. Like by the end, all she can see is her own brain. Well, hot diggity gods damn. Now that we're good and soused, it's time for us to talk to you the way you talk about us. Under your breath and with lots of profanity. It's time for Beeford, Texas's favorite game of questioning and answering, Ask the Goat, where we answer your questions and you question our answers, and sometimes maybe we speak in tongues. And eat banana bread. It happens. Cootie rummages through the malevolent mailbag. Rummage, rummage, rummage. Please be hyper aware that you can always contact us through three. Four. Four? Yeah, four. Four different ways to communicate with us via social media. The first way, and arguably the most popular way, is to send us a question for Ask the Goat by joining our Facebook group. It's a private group, so you're going to have to answer a few questions at the outset. We keep it private in order to prevent hateful shit nuts from sneaking in and making fun of disenfranchised folks or selling us subpar sunglasses. But hey, any member of the Facebook group can send in a question anytime, night or day, sub it or cross quarter. There's no question that we won't answer, no such thing as too much information, and there ain't no river wide enough to keep you from getting to us, baby. Also, feel free to send us an email at our unconsecrated Gmail address, which is thegoatofmadness at gmail.com. Questions, audio files, artwork, gardening tips... You know, guys, whatever's right is right. That is the goat of madness at gmail.com. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> we need more freaking Twitter followers. Hit us up on our brand new Twitter handle at Hail Satan KTG. Hail is capitalized, Satan is capitalized, and KTG is capitalized. Everything else is non un, it's not. I'm running the Twitter feed and you might get some exclusive behind the scenes information that you just won't get anywhere else. Like how you spent one morning listening to the monkeys? That's really compelling and rich. Talk to me on Twitter at Hail Satan KTG because I'm usually there. You can also follow KTG on our brand new Instagram account at Kiss the Goat Podcast. That's all one word, no caps. I'm in charge of the Insta feed, and we are having a great time over there, guys. Shoot me a message or just have fun with all the wacky pictures and memes I'm posting. We've already got three times the number of followers that X's Twitter feed has garnered, which just proves that our acolytes have some of the finest taste of anyone on the Internet. That's at Kiss the Goat Podcast over on Instagram. I mean, it's not a contest. Well, I mean, of course not. The number of followers doesn't matter. Right. Not not at all. As long as we're having fun with it. Exactly. That's a Hail Satan KTG on Twitter. Our first question <laughs> is a holdover from your birthday episode, Cootie Bug. We'd already oh, recorded I know. We'd already recorded the show before this question came in, but Sam Edwards wants to know, Cootie, with your experience throughout all of these satanic cinema ventures, who has been the most handsome male devil? And on the flip side, who has been the most beautiful female devil or uber-powerful demon if you can't think of enough female devils? Oh, holy shit. The most handsome male devil. Um, yeah, I, the only devil I can think of that was a female part was that fucking bedazzled movie, and I did not like that. Oh, Elizabeth Hurley. Ugh. Uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. She's like a scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> Nipples on an ironing board. Yeah, seriously, right? 
No, um, I think that the one that turns me on the most, and you're going to laugh at this, was, uh, and he's not even really called the devil or Satan, but he's the fucking lord of the underworld from Legend. <gasps> Tim Curry. Tim Curry, yeah, yeah. Like, he's got the washboard abs and the broad shoulders and that red, red skin and them big fucking horns, baby. Goat feet. You know that motherfucker's hung. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, frightening, frighteningly hung. Just like, I'm going to hold my breath while you put that in. Yeah. God damn. <laughs> my personal pick for favorite male devil is Gabriel Byrne and End of Days. Uh, He's pretty. He yeah. is not from around here. <laughs> and he managed to wrangle himself into a threesome first night out. You got to respect. You got to give props for that. Female devil, though. I don't know. I'm not even sure who that would be. Yeah, like I said, the only one I can think of is that fucking Bedazzled movie. And that's just the title alone is enough to set my teeth on edge. Yeah, that can't be right. Maybe it is, though. Because all I can think of is Juliet Mills and Beyond the Door. But she wasn't a demon. She was just Mm-mm. she was just possessed and had a kid who drank pea soup from the can with a straw. Mm-hmm. Which pff, that's fucked up. All right, I'm gonna cheat and be like, okay, maybe not the devil, but a demon, and I would go with D. Wallace from Lords of Salem. Oh, was she a demon, really? She was a descendant of of a of a witch. Okay, maybe that's I think thing. you're reaching. <laughs> I probably am. All right. Well, Derek Bourgeois. Is that how you say his name? <laughs> Bourgeois? Burge, Burgio. That's, that's how you're saying it. Burge, <laughs> Burgies. Bourgeois. Derek Burgies. Bourgeois. You know, he ain't from around here. Anyway, Derek wants to know. Let's call him Boo Boo. Oh, Boo Boo. Perfect. That way I don't have to stumble over that last name. So Boo Boo asks, I was wondering if you guys were familiar with any portrayals of hell in comics. The craziest I could think of was when Godzilla went to hell and fought demonic versions of his friends and foes and also even a demon version of himself. Demon Godzilla? Demon Godzilla. Wouldn't that be Satanzilla? You know, Boo Boo's not the first person to ask us a comic book question, so I'm going to repeat myself. Y'all, we don't really read comics. Like, we read The Invisibles, and I think, I I mean, like, I remember seeing some comics, some Dark Horse shit from the 90s when I was married to my first husband. That's really all I know about comics. All I'm going to say is my favorite version of Hell is probably in Todd McFarlane's Spawn books. Yeah. Because it was appropriately red and orange, and (laughs) there were a lot of weird kind of demons that looks like if you took off their mask, they'd just be Al Jurgensen. (laughs) So I was, I'm I'm okay with that. So that's, that's my favorite. All right. Fair enough. Matthew Tangen, being a clever ginger lad, has a question for both of us. What celebrity would you want to engage in a wizard's duel? Maggie Smith. Fuck me, what? I mean, she'd kick my ass, but I would learn a thing or two. Because no matter what you threw at Nick Cave, he'd just be like, no. No. <laughs> he'd shoot it back at you like, fucking, Expelliarmus! No. <laughs> that would be, fuck. Fine. God damn it. I can't beat Nick Cave. <laughs> He's a wanted man, damn it. Isn't that funny? We both want to fight somebody we know we can't beat just for the experience of fighting them. What does that say about us? I don't know. <laughs> I'm about to get my ass kicked, but damn. I want to. I want to fight Abalam. <laughs> Fuck. 
All right, guys, that's going to bring this episode of Kiss the Goat to a close. Thanks to everyone out there for listening. As Brian Adams sang, everything we do, we do it for ourselves, but we share it with you because we are kind, giving people. Don't miss out on exclusive content from your favorite podcasters by joining the Legion Podcast's Patreon. For less than the cost of a loaf of banana bread per day, you can subject yourself to some awesome stuff that you can only hear if you're a Patreon member. Same thing goes for the Legion Podcast YouTube channel, and that's fucking free for crying out loud. Live shows, which are far better than dead shows, exclusive (laughs) material, and early releases by the gods. Legion Podcast has you covered no matter which way you go. All right, well, now that we've had dessert, should we make some dinner? I could use some real food, but after that banana bread debacle, I'm not in the mood to cook anything. Yeah, I don't blame you, me neither. That's fine. I'm just going to see if Stephanie wants to make dinner for us. Oh, no, 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 no. No, fuck no. We'll just order in. (laughs) All right, well, that sounds like a plan. Guys, until next time, I'm Cootie. My name is X. Hail Satan. Satan. Follow Kiss the Goat on Instagram. Twitter, Hail Satan, KDG. Insta's cooler, be a cool person. Twitter has a bird. (laughs) Man, Cootie, I don't know how you do this. (laughs) (laughs) Alcohol, lots of alcohol. Yes. Hello, welcome to Skype call testing service. After the beep, please record a message. Afterwards, your message will be played back to you. Check one, two, check one, two. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Is everything fine? I think everything's fine. Hooray. Okay. There's more. (laughs) Sounded like I just tripped a Cylon. That was me shaking off the sillies. Oh, yeah. How's that working out for you? It, it never works for me. Whoop, whoop. Coming back in three, two. A photograph published by Reuters in July shows the agreement Hussein had I'm written sorry, with Mike. I'm Ma- sorry. I need to interrupt you. It's Reuters. Yeah. Who? Reuters. Reuters. Yeah, it's not Reuters. It's Reuters. Fuck. Yeah. Never actually heard anyone say that out loud. <laughs> it in print many many times did i ever tell you that i used to think facade was pronounced facade i did too did i ever tell you that i used to think misled was pronounced misled that's a good one thought that for years dude like i knew what it meant but i just thought it was misled i thought it was misled with the same definition (laughs) (laughs) reuters reuters yes like goiter this episode's flick is the last exorcism from 2010 which distinguishes its we were doing so good we were doing so good and I've got the first fuck up of the show fine god damn it here we go let's kick it in now (laughs) this episode's flick is the last exorcism from 2010 which (sighs) just have another beer god damn motherfuck shit fuck why can't I say that one goddamn word king roca sand chow (laughs) I know I have like a huge burp in me. I do. And it's being coy. I just can't get it to... Asshole. I can't get it to express how it feels so I can know that it's love is real or some Madonna bullshit. I don't know. Okay. And this one woman talks about the leader of a, of a devil cult who thought... Devil cult. Uh, devil cult. Devil cult. <laughs> Yeah, well, that ending, we're suddenly, we're shown that everything is disturbing. Disturbing. Disturbingly, yes. Well, I mean, that seems to be the way things go. We just make the phone call, make that soon. What do we do? We dial somebody. We fucking pick up a telephone and push buttons as if there's 
phones with buttons anymore. <laughs> Ralph, why is a linen suit the perfect outfit for an exorcist to wear? <laughs> because I actually don't think that it is. Because first of all, if you get if you get pea soup on it, I mean that you're done. You got to throw that that puppy out. Am I right? No dry cleaner in the world can get that shit out. Nothing. I mean, you could scotch uh, guard it. <laughs> 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 it's probably a good idea. What is your favorite incorrect term for a sexual act besides blowing job? <laughs> you know, maybe going back to your your episode on the right. Oh, no. Maybe kissy facing. What do you think? <laughs> kissy facing. <laughs> kissy face. Because honestly, that sounds dirtier than a blowing job. Don't you think kissy facing? Ugh. Who wants to do that? Okay, yeah, that sounds awful. That's way worse than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what? Finger disruption. So the name Abilam is very close to the title of my favorite Genesis album, Abacab. <laughs> if you could name a demon, what would it be, and what would the demon do in the alleged hierarchy of hell? Oh, another good question. Uh, let's see. See, you people think we don't think about this shit. Let's say the demon... Frustrato. That sounds and Italian. And that's a horrible, that's a that's a horrible name. But it's like, when you get frustrated with things on a daily basis, that's a demon, right? Sure. There you go. So, the demon Frustrato. I don't know. Is there a demon for a hang for just a wicked horrible hangover that makes you cry all day? Yeah, I think I think my demon would be Stabifico, and this is the demon that shows up when you accidentally walk into the bed frame. Would you count Battlefield Earth as the Scientology possession film? Oh my god. Why did you mention that film? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean sure. <laughs> Please, please consider me a French mute vampire lesbian. Snarf, snarf. <laughs> that was almost a spit take. <laughs> I was waiting for it. Yeah, it sounds like you need more booze. But let's think. Let's think. Let's think. I got stuck on that. Let's think. Oh my god, well guys, that's going to bring this episode of Kiss the Goat to a close. Thanks to everyone out there for listening. As the Brian Adams song sang. Wait, science, the song sang. Yep. Song, song. You didn't even write that. That was totally on me. I just inserted I know. words that, that were not... I know, that was not my fuck up. I checked that. That was not my fuck mm-hmm. up at all. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Two. That was long.